episode. <laughs> Welcome to Murder Mile. A true crime podcast and audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all set within one square mile of the West End. Today's episode is about the senseless murder of Big Allen, the burly purveyor of illicit pornography on Dean Street, who was robbed by Richard Rhodes Henley, a man so hopelessly addicted to his all-consuming need to masturbate that it would drive him to kill. Murder Mile contains bizarre, lewd and often rude descriptions which may upset those who are easily offended, as well as realistic sounds, so that no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael. I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 16, Richard Rhodes Henley, The Seaman, The Seaman, and The Murder of the Porn Peddler. Today, I'm on Dean Street. Roughly 300 feet north of Old Compton Street and 300 feet south of Oxford Street, in a part of Soho so heavily renovated, scrubbed and sanitised that much of Soho's originality has been erased. As the property prudes move in and any hint of originality moves out. In fact, the only culture left in this part of Dean Street is the famous Soho Theatre, immediately behind me. Where every night, a wealth of right-on wankers, dressed in beards, boots and feather boas, waffle on about how literally yards from here Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, which they profess to know the finer points of, and yet have never actually read, all while starving, having refused to eat sushi at Wagamama's, because apparently they're allergic to fish, intolerant to rice, and are too full of their own shit and are now off to watch a dull arty play about one-legged Armenian strippers with AIDS, knowing it'll be shit, but hoping that, besides being culturally enriching, it'll either have boobs, bums, or a cock in it. Today, 82 Dean Street has been entirely demolished and replaced by a yucky modern monstrosity. And yet the area around 82 Dean Street is a far cry from the seedy street full of sex pests that it once was. Being the bastion for the closet pervert and the chronic masturbator. As a drove of dirty old men in flashing max stifle boners as they troll the mucky bookshops in search of tits, tights and tassels. One of these men, in search of a triple X thrill, was so addicted to his need to spill his seed that it would consume his life and end another. His name was Richard Rhodes Henley. On Wednesday the 24th of October 1956, a ship known as HMCS Iroquois, a tribal class destroyer under the command of the Canadian Navy, berthed in Southampton Dock on the English coast. After 14 months on patrol in the Atlantic, the Mediterranean Sea, the Red Sea and the hostile waters of Korea's post-war peninsula. Needing six days to resupply, refuel and repair, before returning to its home port in Halifax, Canada, half of the ship's crew were given three days leave and as a military vessel of mostly men who'd been cramped together in an oversized tin can for just over a year with no privacy, no space and no outlet for their passions. The second the gangplank was lowered with a whoop and a cheer the dock was splashed in a sea of white as great groups of overexcitable seamen set out in search of girls. 
pulling away from the pack, cutting quite a solitary figure, as he limped along on his crutches. His left foot lame, having twisted it just a few days earlier, was 26-year-old leading seaman Richard Rhodes Henley. And although he was dressed like the others, in his navy-issue uniform of black shoes, dark woolen jersey, a round cap and black bell-bottomed trousers, he looked a little odd. His hero's clothes hung badly off this tall, thin and gangly man with a small feminine mouth and thick lensed glasses. And yet, described by his commanding officer as a cook of exemplary character, whose conduct on board was always first class, Henley's impressive work ethic wasn't just in a deep-rooted desire for praise, promotion and a need to blend in, but it was there to distract him from his dirty addiction. Henley was a masturbator, a chronic masturbator, who dove into his work to keep his mind on the job and his hands out of his pants. As the second he wasn't whipping an egg white, fluffing a pancake batter, or frothing a custard to a creamy head, his dirty desire would take over, and he would dive into the communal navy toilet, known as the head, for a five-knuckle shuffle. Needing to masturbate on an almost hourly basis, Henley's sexual addiction was out of control and impossible to sustain on a cramped ship at sea with not a single second to himself. And so the second that he disembarked, Henley set off on the first train to London and headed into Soho. Eleven years after the end of World War II, with rationing over, prosperity blossoming, and the good times having returned, London's West End was the place to be. As with every bar buzzing, every club thumping, every dance hall fit to burst, and finally the dark-lit streets of Soho being bathed once again by the bright lights of Piccadilly Circus. With just three days leave, every sailor hit the West End hoping to soak up as much vice as possible, whether girls, booze, or gambling. But being a man with so little money and so many debts, Henley never gambled. As a devout Catholic with a wife back home, Henley never visited brothels. And as a drinker, even though he drank, he always drank alone. But these were not his vices, as his drug of choice was pornography. During his three days leave in London, Henley did very little else except troll the mucky bookshops of Soho in search of sexy magazines. But his quest was fruitless. As even though Soho was London's sex shop central, Henley wasn't interested in those mildly titillating top shelf titles where scantily clad ladies display an inch of ankle, a bit of boob, or if you're lucky, a flash of fanny fluff. But having been a chronic masturbator since the age of 12, Henley's addiction was out of control, and with every single sexy photo only able to satisfy him for two or three self-love sessions before boredom would creep in, Henley needed something harder. On Friday the 26th of October, having purchased 25 pornographic photos from a sex shop just a few streets away in Piccadilly, and knowing this was barely enough filth to sustain his sexual appetite for a week, Henley asked the owner if he knew of any other mucky bookshops that sold harder porn, which was kept off the shelves and out of sight as the porn was of such a strong nature that it was illegal. The store Henley was directed towards was at 82 Dean Street, which was ran by Alan Robinson. Although he was born John Alan Dixon Robinson, 
Big Alan, as he was known, was a 36-year-old man of impressive stature. As being over six feet tall and weighing 17 stone, with unflinching eyes and a bear-like beard, who was a no-nonsense World War II veteran with the Royal Fusiliers. His imposing size and gruff demeanour was perfect for his occupation as the manager of a sex shop, a job that required him to deal with all manner of unsavoury characters, such as drunks, perverts, weirdos, conmen and even gangsters. Situated at 82 Dean Street, Big Alan's Soho sex shop was the epitome of discretion, as unlike most jazz mag joints, there was no frosted glass and no neon signs flashing a triple X. Instead, it was a simple white plaster facade, with a number but no name. Just the words, books and magazines, emblazoned on the walls and above the dark wooden door and in the windows, which were protected by black wrought iron railings, were displayed a deceptive collection of erotic novels, lurid fiction and dubious history books, mostly about naked African tribes. Given the illusion, to anyone who wasn't in the know, that this was just a very normal bookshop. That evening, just before closing time, as the last of the bookshop's customers were shuffling out, in walked a tall, slim, bespectacled sailor, replete with bell-bottomed trousers and the naval epaulets of a leading seaman, who was limping on a pair of crutches. And although he was a little shy and socially awkward, he seemed polite, quiet and harmless. Their discussion was cordial and brief. Henley asked Big Alan if he had any hardcore films to sell. He had, and offered him three 16mm stag films for £35 each. Henley agreed, and even though, in today's money, that adds up to a whopping £1,800 for three 10-minute skin flicks, Henley promised he'd return with the money the next day but Henley had no intention of buying them, as he had no money. But what he did have was an all-consuming need for harder and stronger porn, and he would do anything to get it. Spending that Friday evening in the Union Jack Club in Lambeth, South London, an exclusive club for the members of the armed forces, Henley sat alone, sunk back a few whiskies contemplated his rapid descent into a life of crime and later drunkenly stumbled back to the Waverley Hotel in Bloomsbury where he unpacked his kit bag inside which he'd hidden a 9mm German Luger pistol. Born in Creston in Canada, a small town on the southeastern side of British Columbia close to the US border Richard Rhodes Henley was an only child, conceived in illegitimacy, and whose very existence was blamed for the failure of his father's marriage. Regularly beaten by his abusive alcoholic father, Henley's childhood was either spent running away from home or being put into foster care. And the more he drank, the more isolated he became, trapped in a solitary friendless world never once having a loving mentor nor role model to guide him on the tricky issues of love, life and sex. Aged just 12 years old, it was during those hormonally difficult and emotionally sensitive years, as his body grew and his puberty blossomed, that Henley's father caught his son masturbating. A natural act that almost all curious boys engage in, which is easily pacified by calmly discussing the facts of life. This is exactly what his father should have done, but didn't. Henley was abused. Henley was beaten. Henley was whipped. And for the following year, 12-year-old Richard Rhodes Henley would spend every night lying in bed, 
his wrist tightly shackled and bound to a rough leather harness secured around his waist. A barbaric device which was meant to stop this wicked boy from pleasuring himself and his father hoped would cure him of this seedy addiction. But it backfired spectacularly and turned a common childhood habit that he would easily have grown out of into a dark, alluring and rebellious addiction. In 1947, age 17, Henley ran away from home for the final time. In 1948, aged 18, he enlisted in the Canadian Navy to see the world and escape his father forever. In 1950, aged 20, as a devout Roman Catholic, he hastily married his first girlfriend, having, like his father before him, conceived an unplanned child out of wedlock. And as the love dried up, the sex stopped, and the marital bed grew cold, Henley turned to his one true love, masturbation. By 1956, having docked in Southampton, Richard Rhodes Henley was a married man with a five-year-old son, a blossoming naval career, and financial responsibilities. In truth, he wasn't a bad man. He wasn't a drunk nor a druggie. He was never physically, sexually or verbally abusive. He had no STIs, no STDs and no major health issues. And unusually, he wasn't a peeper, a flasher, a groper, a stalker or a sex pest. In fact, prior to this moment, he had never committed a criminal act. But with his drug of choice being pornography, his addiction had consumed his life, his thoughts, his money, and even his actions. And now, being hopelessly broke, he would do anything to get his fix. On the morning of Saturday the 27th of October 1956, at the ungodly hour of 6.30am, Richard Rhodes Henley was witnessed pacing impatiently on his crutches outside of Big Al's bookshop at 82 Dean Street. And although his intention was to commit an armed robbery, he didn't hide his face and he didn't have a disguise. Instead, he wore his full naval uniform, complete with cap, boots and bell bottoms. At 9.30 a.m., Having nervously paced and waited outside for more than three hours, the bookshop finally opened. But it wasn't the terrifyingly imposing frame of Big Al who unlocked the dark wooden door. It was his younger, smaller assistant, Robert Edward Clement, also known as Bob. Racked with nerves and shaking with tension, Henley must have thought that fate was smiling upon him as even though in his pocket he'd stashed the 9mm German Luger, loaded with eight bullets in the mag and one in the chamber. With the street being dead, the shop being empty and Bob being all alone, the robbery would be quick, no one would get hurt and Henley could catch the next train to Southampton Dock before his ship departed, making a slick robbery followed by the perfect getaway. But it was not to be. As with Bob claiming to know nothing about any pornographic films, which his boss had apparently stashed in the back room, a room he had never used as it was practically empty, Bob told Henley to return when Big Alan was back at 12 pm, another two and a half hours later. For two and a half hours, Henley hobbled along the streets of Soho nervously biting his lip, as with his three days leave almost over, and his orders to return to his ship at Southampton Dock by 11am at the very latest. Torn between risking his career and his need for harder pornography, his addiction had won, and Henley sauntered into the Rosen Crown Tavern, just 20 feet away on the corner of St Anne's Court, for a large slug of Dutch courage. And being so nervous, he knocked back almost 300 millilitres of whiskey. 
This is, of course, if you believe Henley's confession. As Bob denied ever opening the shop, ever having keys, meeting Henley, or ever handling any illegal pornographic films. And yet, although Henley claimed he was drunk at the time of the murder, he was never witnessed in the Rosencrown pub that morning, by either the customers or the landlord. He never appeared drunk, and when checked by a police doctor, he had no alcohol in his system. Anyway, at 12pm, with Henley supposedly being inebriated, he returned to the Mucky Bookshop at 82 Dean Street, which consisted of a single room measuring barely 20 feet wide by 20 feet deep, with every inch of wall space riddled with trashy paperbacks, as a small smattering of sheepish-looking customers leaf through the lurid novels, whilst shuffling nearer to the soft pornographic magazines which hung above the shop's serving hatch, behind which stood Bob and Big Alan. With Henley being instantly recognisable in his sailor suit, Big Al grabbed the keys and discreetly ushered him into the locked back room behind the shop, where they privately talked in hushed tones. The back room was bare, except for an empty fireplace, a single wicker chair, oddly placed in the centre of the room which neither man sat in, and a waist-high wooden cabinet, from which Alan pulled three metal tins of 16mm film. With almost £2,000 worth of hardcore films in his hand, a loaded Luger in his pocket, and this very private room secured by a lockable door, a successful end to Henley's pornographic heist was in sight, but his need for newer, harder and more explicit images was so overpowering that with greed having taken over, Henley wanted more. Thinking he must have met his dream customer and that this was his lucky day, Big Al led Henley back into the half-full shop. Through the partitioned area, behind which stood Bob, and now also Sidney Bayard, the shop's accountant, and ushered Henley into Alan's office, where once again, with greater discretion and even quieter voices, Big Al and Henley finally shook hands on a price. For three 16mm films and a box containing 784 pornographic photos, Henley would pay £264, which in today's money is just over £4,500. A price which, as we know, Henley had no plan to pay. Waiting until Alan had wrapped up the films and the photos into two discreetly packaged parcels of brown paper, Henley gave his excuse that he had his money hidden about his person and didn't want to reveal it in the shop. And seeing a large bulge in his jacket, Big Al fatefully guided Henley and the parcels back to the privacy of the locked back room. The second the door was opened, Henley pulled out his pistol and aimed the barrel between Alan's eyes. But with the surprisingly sharp reflexes of an ex-serviceman which belied his imposing size, Alan got the jump on Henley, slammed the backroom door in his face, and believing his armed robbery was a success, Henley fled down the dusty passageway towards the dark wooden door. But it was all a ruse. There was no way that Alan was going to part with almost £5,000 worth of illegal pornographic stock, and before Henley had reached the dark wooden door, he turned to see the six foot one, 17 stone bulk of Big Alan bearing down on him, with fists clenched and anger in his eyes. And feeling truly afraid, Henley panicked and pulled the trigger. And yet, as Alan lay there, dying on the floor, the events which followed it are almost comical. Terrified at what his addiction had driven him to do, as Henley hopelessly limped into Dean Street, 
clutching his stolen parcels of porn, but having left his crutches behind, Bob and Sidney chased the hobbling armed robber at an impressively slow speed. As with Bob having a gammy leg, and the rather rotund Sidney managing little more than a quick waddle, they both shouted, Stop that man! He's shot somebody! As Henley limped down St Anne's Court, dropping both parcels in the process. Ignoring the commotion, a kind lady stopped to help the disabled Henley pick up his scattered pawn parcels. And even though Bob and Sidney, who were limping and waddling behind him in a half-speed pursuit, called out to a passing taxi driver on Wardour Street, shouting, Don't take that sailor! He's shot a man! With the cabbie, Maury schooled, thinking that they were simply just drunken nutters, he picked up Henley and headed in his chosen direction of Waterloo Station to get his train back to Southampton Dock. Henley almost got away. But sensing that something was up, Murray schooled the taxi driver, drove Henley to Trenchard House, a local police section house just one street away on Broadwick Street, where the taxi driver handed the clearly bewildered, shaking and ghostly white Canadian sailor over to Police Constable Alan Cole. But did Henley confess his crime? No. Of course he didn't. He gave the police a total cock and bull story about how, apparently, he'd been beaten up by a teddy boy who had stolen his crutches. His bullshit story of which ended with Henley dragging the incredulous police constable on a wild goose chase through the streets of Soho in search of this mysterious and entirely fictional assailant. All while hiding a 9mm Luger pistol in his pocket and clutching almost £5,000 worth of highly illegal pornography under his arm. Moments later, as he neared Dean Street, Henley was arrested. Thirty minutes later, John Allen Dixon Robinson, also known as Big Allen, died of his injuries at Charing Cross Hospital. And although this single bullet had passed through his bowel, his liver and his back, causing massive internal bleeding. It was shock that ultimately killed Alan. Upon his arrest at West End Central Police Station, Henley gave a full confession, freely admitting he had committed an armed robbery to fuel his addiction to hardcore pornography and masturbation. Henley was searched, and amongst his possessions they found a £10 note, eight shillings in silver, seven and a half pence in copper, one Canadian dollar, a return ticket to Southampton, a Navy leave pass, an organ donor card, a liquor permit, ten pornographic photos, plus another 25 pornographic photos, plus two parcels containing three 16mm hardcore films, numerous mucky books and magazines, and another 784 illicit photos as well as a bottle of liniment, which although it is used as a pain relief lotion, also causes a tingling sensation in the more sensitive parts of the body. Hence it was here that Henley finally admitted that he had a problem. On the 25th of December 1956, at the Old Bailey, Richard Rhodes Henley was declared mentally fit to stand trial a charge which normally warrants a sentence of life in prison. But with Henley having taken a life in the pursuit of a robbery, he was found guilty of all charges and was sentenced to death. But not wishing to cause a major diplomatic incident between the two allies by having a Canadian sailor executed on British soil, the then Home Secretary, Mr Gwillem Lloyd George, ordered a reprieve of the case, and within days, Henley's death sentence had been commuted from execution to the most lenient term possible, just 15 years in prison. Richard Rhodes Henley was sent to HMP Parkhurst, a brutal Victorian maximum security prison on the Isle of Wight, a cold and lonely two-mile island off the English coast 
where as a murderer, he was not permitted to work in the kitchens. And so instead, he stayed in his cell, 23 hours a day, seven days a week, for 15 long years, lying on his bed, alone with nothing but his dirty thoughts, his eager penis, and his fumbling hands. And with no doctors to treat his addiction, no psychiatrist to cure his affliction, and no drugs to dampen his sexual urges, only a lot of time and too much boredom, on an undisclosed day in the early 1970s, having served his sentence, and I'm sure learned his lesson, Richard Rhodes Henley was released from prison, he boarded a boat, and he returned to his home country of Canada. And so, to Murder Mile's Canadian listeners, I just wanted to say good night and sleep well. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. Each week in this section, I'll be proudly introducing you to a new true crime podcast, which I love and want to share with you. This week's treat is the fabulous Dark Poutine, hosted by the brilliant Mike and Scott, who have an amazingly warm chemistry together, a passion for their subject, and a genuine compassion for the victims, as they delve into the depths of Canada's dark and mucky past. It's one of my go-to podcasts, even if it has put me off ever going to Canada. Hello, Murder Mile listeners and future friends. I'm Mike Brown, half of the Dark Poutine podcast. Scott's elsewhere, definitely not reading a book or doing any research of any kind. If you're interested in a podcast with a focus on Canadian true crime and weird Canadian history told to you by two regular guys who know nothing about anything, then Dark Poutine is for you. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or any other podcast directory. Or check us out at www.darkpoutine.com. Finally, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Now back to the Murder Mile. And don't forget to check out my blog for more photos, videos and maps surrounding this case and all other episodes by going to my website murdermiletours.com forward slash blog or check out the Murder Mile podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Pinterest. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Next week's episode is David Martin, the baffling case of the transsexual Houdini. Thank you, and sleep well.